Welcome everyone. In this podcast, we're going to talk about gluconeogenesis. Over the past few podcasts, we've talked about how we could go from glucose to pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and then how that's used in the citric acid cycle. Now it's important to remember that this molecule of glucose is important. It's important for many functions in the cell, not just to make energy. And so sometimes we have to find a way to store this energy. So what I want you to remember is that in animals, considerable amounts of glucose are needed. We need to make sure we have a constant su supply of glucose for muscle contractions, for brain function, and of course many other functions in our bodies. If we didn't have a way to store glucose in times of excessive exercise or fasting, we would quickly utilize all of our glucose and that could be bad. So what gluconeogenesis is, is the conversion of pyruvate here back to glucose. Now what you might be thinking and shouting at me through the camera is, but Gorsuch, you told us there were these three irreversible glycolytic pathways or reactions. If there are three steps here that are irreversible, how do we ever go back to glucose? I want you to remember that the word irreversible is enzyme specific. The enzyme that regulates these three irre irreversible glycolytic reactions is so effective at binding its substrate and converting it into product that it can't go the other way. So it's irreversible just because that enzyme itself doesn't go back. So how does gluconeogenesis work? It re works because we use new, or different I should say, enzymes. Enzymes specific for just gluconeogenesis. We don't use the enzymes going from glucose to pyruvate. We use three new enzymes going from pyruvate back to glucose to overcome these irreversible glycolytic reactions. Now the question that might come to your mind is, how does the cell know to go from glucose to pyruvate or from pyruvate to glucose? It appears to know which direction to go at one of these irreversible enzymes. So remember, our step three, we took fructose 6-phosphate and we converted that into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And the enzyme that made fructose 1,6-bisphosphate was called phosphofructose kinase. And the glycolytic enzyme that produced fructose 1,6-bisphosphate was called phosphofructose kinase. The gluconeogenesis enzyme that converts fructose 1,6-bisphosphate back into fructose 6-phosphate is called fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. So how does the cell know to allow the pathway to move in one or the other direction? It does so using positive and negative feedback. Remember, if it goes in this, this direction, the cell will make ATP. If it goes in this direction, no ATP is made. So as ATP is being metabolized to ADP and inorganic phosphate, those byproducts will bind to phosphofructokinase. Now, so I don't have to rewrite this enzyme here. I'm just going to draw a red circle with an active site in it. If ADP or PI, inorganic phosphate, binds to this enzyme, it is active. I'll say that again. If ATP is being hydrolyzed, that means it's being used, so we need more of it the byproducts of ATP hydrolysis, ADP and PI, will bind to phosphofructokinase. When they bind to phosphofructokinase, it will activate it. So that's the positive feedback. Now, if ATP is in abundance and it's not being hydrolyzed, the cell has enough ATP. ATP will bind to a different site on the enzyme and repress it. The cell has enough ATP, that ATP negatively regulates phosphofructose kinase and represses it. Now the reverse is true for fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. So I'll draw that enzyme, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, in green. 
when ATP is being used and it's generating ADP and PI, those components, ADP and PI, will bind to fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase and repress it. On the other hand, if there are large stores of ATP and there's no need to make more ATP, ATP will bind to fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase and make it active. So let me review that. When ATP is being used, the cell is generating the byproducts of ADP and PI. If it's being used, that means the cell needs to make more. ADP will bind to phosphofructose kinase and activate it. It will also bind to fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase and repress it. In times when the ATP is abundant, there's no need to make more ATP. ATP represses phosphofructose kinase and it will activate fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. And once fructose 6-phosphate is made, it will carry on and eventually make glucose. However, there aren't large stores of glucose existing in our cells as a monosaccharide all by themselves. Rather, what happens is glucose forms this highly branched polymer known as glycogen. So I'll write that here, highly branched polymer of glucose. Glycogen is stored in the cytoplasm. It's stored in the cytoplasm of many cells, but we see large concentrations of glycogen in the liver and muscles. Now, how do we get glucose from, the, from glycogen once we want to use it again? Well, we never make glucose again exactly, but rather what happens is glycogen is converted into glucose 1-phosphate which is then converted into glucose 6-phosphate, which then enters into glycolysis. Now I want you to know one enzyme here that I didn't mention, and that is the enzy enzyme that converts glycogen into glucose 1-phosphate, and that is called glycogen phosphorylase. Okay, that ends the podcast for gluconeogenesis. Next, we'll jump into the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you come see me. If not, I'll see you in class. Bye.